Funding for this program was made possible through a grant from the Lilly Endowment. In 1960, Billy Graham preached to crowds of Christians and Muslims on a vacant rocky hilltop near Africa's tallest peak, Mount Kilimanjaro. The East African British colony was still a year and a half from becoming the independent nation of Tanganyika. Graham's appearance was part of a larger African crusade that took the North Carolina-born evangelist and his team across the continent. The Moshi event, though small when compared with crusades that took place before and after, illustrates the long-term impact the Graham Crusades continue to have on global Christianity. My name is Elisifa Mshomi. I came and attended preaching. This ground was all bush. There's nothing here. And he preached and we sang. This was the, the word of God. People just came. Something they had never seen before. <laughs> all denominations and from all over, Lutheran, Roman Catholics, even Muslims came to listen. People sing only between how great thou art. Everybody was just stimulated. And that's why the ground was given to the Lutherans after he did the preaching. The first thing they did was to build the church there. And there was a huge stone here, still there. The song of which really moved the people, 391. And if you haven't been to the foot of that cross and been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Between 1947 and 2005, Billy Graham preached to more than 200 million people across North America, Europe, Asia, Latin America, and Africa. Millions more watched live on television and radio. Known as Crusades, the gatherings in stadiums, sports arenas, and large open air parks represented the tip of an organizational iceberg. It took years of planning before and months of follow-up after the events took place. The Crusade shaped the face of evangelical Christianity in the 20th century, served as a catalyst for numerous parachurch organizations, influenced global ecumenical efforts, and altered the course of untold individual lives. The Crusades were the centerpiece of a massive movement to project the gospel. What it represents is a concert of people focused on accomplishing one thing. We have the media, we have organization of prayer, of local church groups, an advertising blitz that was not unprecedented but unparalleled in the history of evangelicalism. The immense audiences that could be gathered which immediately lend a sense of importance to what's going on. So people want to know why so many people come. People care about what 50,000 or 75,000 people are hearing. And they care about the man who is addressing them. And so it gives a kind of uh, importance just by sheer size. The Crusades were his main reason for being in ministry. He wanted to preach the gospel and he wanted to reach as many people as he could. When you look at the Crusades, you find a demand for faith. You find a very lively faith culture that relates to politics, consumerism, globalization. He said, that's my calling. I've had an opportunity to be a movie actor. I turned that down. I've been in a, an opportunity to be a college president. I did that only briefly and not again. Um, there are all kinds of things that I could do with parts of my life, but God said, Billy, I want you to preach the good news. Billy Graham first came to prominence in the mid-1940s after graduating from Wheaton College outside Chicago. 
While serving as the pastor of a small suburban church, Graham achieved initial success through the burgeoning Youth for Christ movement. Graham became the organization's first paid employee and spoke in rallies throughout North America and Europe. During a brief experience as a college president at Northwestern College in Minnesota, Graham launched into a full-time ministry as an evangelist. He quickly drew together a team, the core of which worked with Graham through the duration of his ministry. Mr. Graham just didn't show up in a city or say, hey, let's rent a stadium and advertise it and see who shows up. Uh, it was always at the invitation of local churches and a committee that would come together. The policy of the Billy Graham evangelistic enterprise is that they don't go where they're not invited by a local committee. And the reason for that goes back to a, a wonderful story that Billy told in a meeting in our living room while he was here. And that is, he said, after the team f got organized, and I think after they had their first crusade in Los Angeles, he gathered the whole team together for a day's retreat, and he told them each to go to their room, pray and think about how Satan had attacked the work of prior evangelists, and then they would come together that afternoon and see what kind of defenses the Lord would lead them to erect against such attacks. And so they did that, and one of the, uh, one of the methods of attack was evangelists not connected with the local churches. And so they adopted as the defense that their policy would be only go where they were invited by a committee representative of local churches to hold a crusade. Billy Graham was acquainted with my father, Peter Danica. When they would prepare themselves for these congresses and rallies, he actually appointed my father to be the prayer chairman of all of their pre-congress and pre-meetings, uh, preparing it with prayer. They were, of course, very dramatic events. And if they worked, they worked because of a major mobilization of Christian workers on the ground, getting Christians to be in fellowship and partnership with each other in order to make this event happen and get the gospel proclaimed in public in ways that none of them could accomplish by themselves. The preparations take more than a year. When the crusade was getting organized, the committee came to me and asked if I would chair the executive committee. I agreed to do that. The executive committee was a very impressive organization, about 40 key pastors and laymen from many churches all over the Triangle. The normal pattern would be that a group would be getting together in a city. It might be some of the local pastors. It might be lay people who were committed to the city and been praying for the city or concerned about the city's spiritual welfare. And over a process of time, they would say, we think we need a Billy Graham crusade. And they would eventually perhaps get together and uh, invite someone from the Billy Graham Association to come and to speak with them about that possibility. And uh, it would evolve from there. We were set up originally in 1974 to have Billy preach in the bull ring in Lisbon. We had a Portuguese an American committee, and we had uh, we had a representative from from BGEA over there, uh, resident for six months, and Billy came over to the uh, to the country. I had him speak to 350 pastors in one of the hotels in Lisbon. The dictatorship was passing out at that time. The State Department in Washington contacted our committee, told Rosina and I we were the chairman of the committee that you guys, you want to be famous for killing Billy Graham. We said, no. Well, if you proceed with this, uh, we have no security in Lisbon. We have no security for his life. In any stadium in the States, we clear everything within rifle range of the pulpit. We can't do that in Portugal. Now, we'd been after him for 14 years. He was accepting an average of 3,000 requests for crusades per year, he told me and he picked eight, and we were one of them. And we're supposed to give that up? We took a vote. Only two guys said, let the Lord handle it. 
And the rest said, we don't want to be famous for killing Billy Graham. We would send in someone, perhaps a year in advance, maybe a small staff, but they would be working with the volunteers in that area, and they would be the ones who would be carrying out uh, most of the actual work. I am convinced that in a city, often the first ones to lead the way in citywide campaigns are business people. Uh, clergy come a close second, with exceptions. Some of them are way ahead. Business people have a broad vision. They love their city, they care for the city, they're in business in the city, they're established there. They're in town with their families, their children, their grandchildren, and they love the city and they want the city blessed. If they're believers, they want to see as many converted as possible. It involved a lot of meetings, <laughs> but it also involved being the interface between the executive committee and the professional Billy Graham staff, which came in a year before the crusade to coordinate the preparations. My father, was intimately involved with the original team and watched the care with which the team carried out its evangelistic activities, the care with which they managed the finances, the care with which uh, they were very strict about um, the appearances of evil. Then you have fundraising, which is a major issue to touch a city whether it's a small one of say half a million or 300,000 or a, a, a one like Buenos Aires with 13 million or New York with 15, you've got to work a long time to raise the funds. And then the publicity, that goes on long before. For a year, year and a half, two, sometimes three years in the big, big cities, you're doing all this at the same time and all the prayer, of course, that goes into it and so on. And then when you go public, then that's sort of the, the tip of the iceberg. Underneath is all the other things that have gone on. We have millions of Americans today that are mentally ill. And Jesus said, when this tension begins to break you down and you betray one another, many shall be offended. He said, this is also a sign. I think the Crusades were the centerpiece, and what constituted the center of the centerpiece was the Graham Sermon. It was the combination of the voice, the gestures, the timing, the vocabulary, his command of the biblical text, and how he put it all together that was unique. He sweated over his messages, even though the essence of the gospel never changes, but the introductions and all that, you know. I was in the room with him many times. He said, no, we're going to cross this one out. And then, and then I had to read it, you know, so as to interpret for him into Spanish. He prepared very hard. He wasn't just a flighty evangelist who just shouts John 3.16. Making their commitment to Christ. They wanted to know the truth. They wanted to know the truth always wanted to know the audience and one of the things in knowing the audience is to know what the hurts are what the what the itches are that need scratching that would help mr graham as he developed uh, sermons on whether it might be loneliness or might be the family or issues like that uh, that really spoke to the deepest needs that people were sensing, uh, but on his part, pointing them to the deeper need, the spiritual need uh, that they would have as well, that Jesus Christ was able to answer. What's impressive about Graham is the way he, uh, over the stretch of his career, especially when he's at his height of influence between the, the early 50s and the 1980s is the way this, this prophetic figure, someone who is very outspoken, for instance, against communism, matures and becomes a diplomat. And in that sense, by the 70s, when the world needs a diplomat, Graham is able to, to provide that. Southern California really, by 1949, was ready for this kind of outburst of revivalistic energy coupled with the baby boom beginning at that very moment. Los Angeles is, by the late 40s, really the epicenter for uh, growth uh, and for really a new vision of America. And so the churches respond to that. They are growing rapidly, they are growing also in wealth, and they are looking for opportunities to increase their influence and also win new converts to Christianity. And Billy Graham 
uh, a young man who's just emerging at this point uh, strikes them as the perfect individual to uh, kind of lead this revival. I do not believe that any man, that any man can solve the problems of life without Jesus Christ. The scene is set for Billy Graham. He steps into it and because of his natural abilities, his charisma, uh, his dynamic outlook, which meshes with the kind of prosperity and with the excitement of the era, uh, is really positioned perfectly to, to tap into the resources that Los Angeles has now. If you look back at the Los Angeles crusade and listen to the audio tapes, you'll hear a program that was much less conscious, at least overtly conscious of time. There's lots more music, there's lots more laid back kind of testimony conversation. Um, it was more in the tradition of an old-fashioned tent revival. The journalist created Billy Graham as a national and international phenomenon uh, in that 49 crusade. Notably William Randolph Hearst, who uh, was the owner of the Los Angeles papers. By the late 40s, his name has become a journalistic commodity. Billy Graham is able to uh, conceive of and construct a, a revival, a gathering that attracts people across denominational lines and also across cultural and political lines. Uh, and that too is going to become essential to the success of this revival and also its long-term impact. When Billy Graham emerged, he emerged at the perfect time. America itself was about consensus. It was about forming a united front against an external enemy such as communism. And so Graham, uh, while he was uh, talented and skilled at bringing together diverse groups, was also able to do so because the the uh, constraints in place at that point. Today, I don't think we, we there is that possibility. Los Angeles will at that moment really become, again, for his own ministry, uh, the access point, the launch for a ministry around the world, uh, and especially into Asia and across the Pacific. The whole 1950s, we understand them as an era of this unbridled optimism and the leave it to beaver scenario and all those kinds of things. But really, when you start digging underneath the 1950s, post-World War II America is a misnomer. It's not post-war. The war is still very much present in people's homes. As the Cold War went on, people became aware that this was a very dangerous situation. That you could not have this constant escalation of nuclear weapons, biochemical weapons, without there being some crisis that could uh, uh, tip us over the edge in some way. And Mr. Graham became very aware of that as well. What's wrong with the world? I think every one of us tonight agrees that something is terribly wrong with the world in which we live. This program is being seen tonight live in Little Rock. And today in Little Rock, Arkansas, they had a vote which illustrates racial tension that is sweeping the nation. Not only in the South, but other parts of the nation as well. Why do we have these tensions in life? Why do we have these explosive problems in every generation? We also recognize that we may be on the verge of war in the Far East, a war of nuclear weapons that could destroy even civilization itself. In the early years, there was always the setup, we might call it, where he would look at national and international crises. And this was the setup for then going on to say, but there's a solution. There's a solution to personal crises, to national and international crises. And that solution lies in the transformation possible in Christ. During the early part of Mr. Graham's ministry on through the 60s, uh, the Cold War was, uh, can I say, a flame. It was very much a reality, and it was a reality on both sides in terms of uh, the politics. Billy Graham's anti-communism in 1949 is pretty strident and pretty aggressive, and he will continue to speak in those terms uh, for quite some time, and it's little wonder that he does so. Demonstrating the importance of civil defense preparedness, the elaborate exercises proved survival is possible, offering new hope to all who live in the shadow of the atomic age. It really is an era of promise and peril, and I think that's also why Graham and other Protestant 
figures in the period were influential and had an audience because they're speaking to these kinds of concerns. There was a lot of talk about religion, not just in theological circles, but also in intellectual circles. And this all relates in a broader sense to the Cold War, because there was not just this narrative that we have to be a free world, but there was also this idea this free world could be a Christian world, like the old Occident, something that was not just brought together by democracy, but also by a higher moral order that you could call Christian. The Bible says there's pleasure in sin for a season. You can have a good time for a little bit. But then the Bible said it's all over. Soon the eternal hangover begins. The context is ripe for someone speaking about issues of ultimate consequence and significance, which Graham is doing. He's tapping into this age of anxiety, experience of loneliness, anxiousness, etc. There are already forces at work that he is, yes, pushing along, but he's certainly in, in the right moment. Jeremiah 17. 17 different denominations and over 3,000 individual churches worked to bring about the 57 Crusade. It wasn't just Manhattan, it was all of New York and the whole New York region that was involved. And if that had gone badly, um, I think it's entirely imaginable uh, that uh, Graham's career uh, would have at least been less prominent and could quite possibly have disintegrated. I'm Wallace Alcorn, and in 1957, I was national news editor of Christian Life magazine based in Chicago, and they asked me to cover the New York Billy Graham crusade. Almost 10 years, the, the earlier meetings began to be held, at least in 51. Uh, they wanted to go to New York. And the big question was under whose sponsorship would they go? and they began to talk with the people who approached them, uh, the fundamentalist evangelical conservative pastors and, and uh, laymen in the area. But then Graham had a change in his thinking during that process. He asked that everybody be invited, no matter what their background is. If, if they were willing to come, he wanted them to be able to come. And he wanted the churches that would not uh, traditionally become involved to become involved, and he needed the support of them. The New York Crusade actually started three years before it started. I say that because uh, an invitation was issued to Graham in 1954, and he declined it. The reason he declined it in 54 is because it did not come from a wide spectrum of churches. It came from evangelicals alone. And Graham was determined that if he went to New York, it would represent the consensus of the majority of churches in New York. My name is Gene Smiley, and I attended the Billy Graham Crusade in Madison Square Garden in 1957. I was just a little kid. My father had been a pastor in rural parts of Ohio and West Virginia, so I was used to living way out in the country, and it was a big deal to us to go up to New York City anytime, visit my grandparents there, visit my cousins. And this particular time, Dad said, we're going to go see Billy Graham. And of course, I'd heard that name a little bit. He was already fairly well known. And we went to this incredible event in a huge stadium and again I was a little kid from the rural parts of this country I'd never even been to a, a baseball game you know let alone to a building packed with tens of thousands of people to hear a preacher <laughs> in a very real way fundamentalism did not exist at all until that New York crusade it was the New York crusade that involved uh, a wide spectrum of Protestants and a few Catholics that created a self-conscious fundamentalist movement over against evangelicals. And it would be hard to exaggerate uh, how much bitterness Graham created. The fundamentalists said, we are determined to do battle royal for the fundamentals of the faith. They thought that authentic Christian belief was being threatened and they were going to defend it. And if that meant breaking with other professing Christians, they would do it. But on the other hand, they were revivalists. 
They wanted to bring the gospel, and they wanted, to, you know, as the Apostle Paul said, to be all things to all people for the sake of the gospel. And so that meant bringing people together. Billy certainly turned on the bringing people together side of things. There has been a great unity among the churches, and God honors the church when there's a one accord, and we gather together to do his work. What I thought of myself before that as belonging to this little sect, as it seemed, kind of a minority little group uh, in the society, all of a sudden it was a different feeling. You walk into a building and there are tens of thousands of people all singing these hymns. It's like, whoa, this is much bigger than I thought. American evangelicals in the 1940s and 50s were getting a world vision. They had been a mission sending people already. Before the Second World War, America had become this vast continental empire, a huge powerful nation, but it had really not engaged in, other than that brief incursion in World War I, had not seen itself as a world power or constantly involved in the world's affairs, and there were many American politicians who argued against that, who said, we ought to stay in splendid isolation from all this corrupt uh, warmongering that goes on in Europe. But World War II changed that probably forever in America, and Americans became more conscious of a role to play in the world. And among evangelicals who were already mission-minded, this had an explosive effect. We give God all the glory and praise and honor for everything that has happened. It has been God's doing in answer to the prayers of God's people around the world that we have seen the beginning of this great spiritual awakening in Great Britain. Billy Graham came to Europe as a catalyst, like basically bringing very traditional forms of Protestant or Christian faith and belief into a modernized version. The European churches, it was this boat going back and forth, the experience of the, of the Second World War, the Holocaust, of course, then the beginning of the Cold War, the rise of a new world order. Churches were under pressure to give new answers. And uh, I think that was, that was the breeding ground. There was a transatlantic circulation of evangelists between North America and Europe, especially the United Kingdom, that goes back to colonial days. That was what Mr. Graham did in England. There was a huge debate going on in theological circles, but also among priests and um, ministers. How could a modernized faith look like? And Billy Graham brought the answer. So it was a really abstract discourse about theology and how to like, make the faith more attractive for the second part of the 20th century. And then Billy Graham came over and said like, oh, it's easy, you just have, you need a very traditional message, but basically advertise it, sell it. I mean, combine it with what we call the rise of consumerism. I mean, that was very appealing. So when Billy Graham came to London in 54 as part of his first uh, European crusade that not just took him to the UK, but also to Germany and uh, I think the Netherlands and Scandinavia, um, it was, I would say, the last time in Europe that we had a kind of a re-Christianization wave. There was a lot about talk about the Second World War and uh, how it related to secularization. And there was a real need to going back to religion. So there was um, a demand for a product that was religious, spiritual. It's organized like a business. And so the first thing they do, they rent Haringey Arena. It's a big risk. It's a huge venue. It's a secular venue. So it's not a tent that is set up for the crusade but it's already there and usually it's a sports arena it's a, it's an event ground it's it's deeply secular and it's going to be billy graham's well um work to transform it into a kind of a religious venue. As we can see when we look at the people who go there, of course the Catholics are going as well. They are as curious as their Protestant Christian peers and they have the same questions. That is the important thing. So Billy Graham was able to answer the questions that Christians on different parts of the faith spectrum had. There's this big thing going to happen. I was going to be I was 15, 1955, the Haringey Arena. 
and the controversy whether this American evangelist should come here. But our church was very keen on it. There was a, a retired army major general called Major General Wilson Haffenden who was very keen on Billy Graham, born again Christian, and that whole notion of being born again. Uh, and I was, uh, I was going along with it. I mean, one was caught up in it because it made one feel loved and, and cared for. And uh, so a lot of us went to Haringey. But I have one tremendous fear tonight. And the fear is this, that you may be looking to a man or a team from America to bring revival. No man can bring revival. The Herringay campaign, I've heard of one significant evangelical leader after another who was either converted in that campaign or called to the ministry through that campaign. I don't know what it was about it. I think part of it was the fact that they had the InterVarsity people really mobilizing and bringing in impressionable young Christians from Oxford and Cambridge but that campaign seemed to catalyze uh, a, a new generation of evangelical leaders in the United Kingdom and, and out into the Commonwealth. Is there an increase in church membership or not? And what you can see is, yes, you do have an increase in membership in London, for example, for the first six months after the crusade, but then it declines again. So I thought if you're looking for the real impact, when you're looking for the results, you have to look for something else that is not just related to numbers. And I would say on the one hand, he had an impact on the religious landscape because he basically steered and, and catalyzed debates that were going on in other churches about the same time. So I would say he had an incredible impact on how people related their faith to questions of politics, consumerism, globalization, basically the future of the 20th century. I think there he had a real impact. And I think that people who attended the Crusades, even if they stepped forward or not, Billy Graham changed the way they basically expressed their faith in the future, the way they talked about their faith. I think there definitely is an impact. Moscow was a city of seven million. There was one Protestant church open, the Baptist church there, when we first went. And that was one reason why people would go there, tourists would go there and say, oh, the church was crowded. Well, of course it was crowded. It was the only building in the city where uh, people of Protestant conviction could come. Think of what it would mean if you were an evangelical in the Soviet Union when the communist regime was in charge and trying to control, if not suppress, religion, and certainly didn't like sectarians around, and neither did the Orthodox churches, for that matter. So you're a Baptist in Russia, and uh, uh, you learn that uh, Mr. Graham is going to uh, be visiting a variety of cities. He's going to be uh, preaching wherever he can, in as big as public place as he can, and that's exciting. Well, the communists, of course, said only, this is a religion only for grandmas. Then all of a sudden, this famous American, tall, good-looking, educated man appears by the name of Billy Graham, and they're just astounded. My name is Alexander Krishuk. I grew up in a Christian family. When I'd been uh, 25 years old, in 1991, uh, we get information about preparation for the Billy Graham Crusade in Moscow. It was a wonderful experience for us. In Soviet time of persecution, we have no possibility to take part in big mass evangelism, only personal evangelism. And also we use uh, different events like, like funeral or wedding or, or uh, celebrating like Christmas or Easter but no possible to go to public place for uh, preaching. But when we get uh, information, it's possible to have mass evangelism and stadium. Even uh, Billy Graham personally will be come in Moscow and will preach there. It was great enthusiasm for us to come there and to be the part of that ministry. It was on one side great inspiration for us to see so many our colleagues 
Uh, we didn't know one another because we're spreading a lot around all Soviet Union, you know, Far East of Russia and Baltic Republic, Ukraine, and we never see one another. And other side, it was a fear how it's possible to join uh, this mass as a one choir. The central point of the crusade that took place in Seoul in May of 1972 is simply the massiveness of the response. And it took place on a tarmac, an abandoned tarmac in Seoul. One million two hundred and some thousand people gathered to hear Graham preach that day. They have tabulated that number with aerial photographs, and so it's, it's pretty reliable. This likely was the largest gathering of humans in history for a religious purpose, uh, more specifically to hear someone speak. The huge campaign in, in Korea that uh, probably set a record in attendance but also brought encouragement to the churches in Korea. He loves you so much that if you had been the only person in the world, he would have died for you. Billy Kim is an important figure in his own right. Um, he was a graduate of Bob Jones University, and uh, by all accounts, uh, his rendering a Graham sermon in Korean uh, was as charismatic as Graham's initial presentation. And so it was a one-two punch. It was Graham and, uh, and Billy Kim. A different context than the Soviet Union, but the similarity is Christianity is a minority group. Here, major attention from American leaders, many people who had a heart for Korea reaching out once again in their direction. The eventfulness of the proclamation of the gospel in front of the hugest audience ever assembled under the care of a network of Christian leaders as never assembled before. That was a remarkable event and I think one of the things that, that helped to encourage and stimulate something that was already on, going on in South Korea but the evidence of it was to be seen in the 80s and 90s and that is rapid church growth. One of the lasting effects of a crusade in any city is that uh, it brings believers together. It crosses denominational lines, it crosses uh, racial and ethnic lines, and people who are quite content to plow the field in front of them to uh, serve uh, the people that were in their tradition um, got a bigger vision and participated in something larger. One of the great things that he did was to unify the church worldwide by the emphasis on evangelism because when all is said and done, the church that loves Christ, which is the majority, uh, nevertheless doesn't work together well. The one thing that brings people together is evangelism. It's about the only thing. Everything else is up for grabs and debates and arguments and so on. And Mr. Graham was an example to us all. One of the effects in virtually any place where Mr. Graham has gone, and it's, it's certainly intended on our part, is that churches do come together. And time and time again, you have pastors saying, I never knew him. Here he is down the street from me in another church, another denomination, I never knew him, and here he is, my brother in Christ, here are my sisters in Christ. Uh, it's a remarkable thing how the Christian community does come together because of a crusade. It was definitely Billy Graham who had this ability to bring people from all different faith backgrounds together. And that is one of his like, most important strengths, I would say. And uh, it definitely worked in Europe. In 1985 and 86, I was a Christian Missionary Alliance missionary in France, studying the French language and culture in preparation to go to French-speaking West Africa. And during that year that I was there, 
many, many churches throughout France were preparing for the Billy Graham crusade. It was going to be in September of 1986 in Paris. He brought people together who, whose churches were two blocks apart and yet whose people wouldn't speak to each other for decades. There in France where in particular you have a really heightened individualism and isolationism and Billy Graham crusade basically says we're coming to town we, we want you all to cooperate and we want you to work together and prepare. People uh, were encouraged by that. They, like Elijah, thought only I am left, only our little flock here. And lo and behold, you see the Lord's been doing work in all these other uh, corners of the city too. It is one of the results, oh, the unity, I met people I never knew existed and we love each other. And the unity is one of the best memories that remain out, out of a festival. Many people say, will it last? Somebody asked Billy Sunday if his revivals lasted. Well, he said, maybe it doesn't last in some aspects. He said, neither does a bath last, but he said, you need one once in a while. The, the evidence is overwhelming that most of the inquirers, or converts, if you wish, were not sky blue conversions. Uh, the overwhelming majority were people who made a recommitment of their lives in the grand meetings. They adopted a whole three-method follow-up technique in which the person who comes forward is counseled and fills out the card. Then they get a mailed Bible study packet on the Gospel of John and the follow-up cards that call for a response back to Minneapolis. Okay they get the card gets sent to a local pastor of a church or denomination of their choice if that pastor doesn't respond that he has contacted that person within a couple of weeks it gets sent to a different pastor five years later i was called as pastor of a church on the jersey on the north jersey shore and of course one of the first things that i needed to do is get to know my people i needed to know who the leaders were could i rely on them i needed to know who were inquirers who were interested in the gospel and, and who were actually Christian believers because they'd accepted Christ as their savior. So one of the crucial questions was, uh, did you ever make a decision to accept Jesus Christ as your savior? And if so, when and where was that? What were the circumstances? And people would look at me uh, almost with a blank look on their face and say, well, why should you ask? It was at the Billy Graham meetings. Bob and Lois Firm were an interesting couple. They both had their impact in terms of our understanding today of the long-range impact of the Crusades. Lois had a doctorate in library science, and she was very skilled as a researcher. And she was given the commission to go around after Crusades and particularly talk about with the leadership of those Crusades, how the Crusade had been organized, uh, what problems there were, what uh, impact there was, things like that. Mr. Shapiresky is the arrangements chairman for this crusade and was also doing that same task back in 1964. And you, well, you were telling me that your mother was in the 1949 Billy Graham crusade on Washington Hill Street in Los Angeles. That's right. That was the one where they had the big tent and I believe it was the his first large uh, campaign and she acted as a counselor. She um, had uh, 10 people that were given to her for uh, follow-up counseling. Eight years later, and two of them were uh, pastors and two of them were deacons in churches. And That's record. a pretty high batting average. Now did these folks... Bob Firm was given the uh, commission to really look into the question of what impact on an individual level does a crusade have. Uh, because after all, uh, a lot of the criticism about uh, mass evangelism uh, is that it uh, just comes and goes and vanishes. There's no long-range impact. And after all, that's true sometimes. When Mr. Graham had brought Bob on, he realized this gift that Bob had for meeting with people and eliciting from them uh, their concerns in a low-key kind of way, answering them by developing a questionnaire that he would give to people who had genuinely 
been touched by the crusade, and ultimately not by the crusade alone, but by the gospel, their commitment to Jesus Christ, and their involvement within the larger Christian community. Mr. Robert O'Firm, Director of Research, Please forgive me for writing a letter in place of filling out the enclosed form. There just isn't enough room. The early years of my life were a living hell. Six years ago, God called me through Billy Graham over TV. My story is a miracle. He never attributed it to himself. He always said it was God working through me who changed those lives. We cannot overstate the importance of the teamwork, not just teamwork going on to that, a very special kind of teamwork, collaborative, deep friendship that developed between uh, Graham and Shay, and then Graham and Barrows, and then Barrows and Shay, and that included their families and their children. So this was really a familial closeness. And the fact that these people stayed together for nearly 60 years, so, th so that the same voices, the same principles, the same sound. You could bring five other groups. You could bring DC Talk and Michael W. Smith and Cutlass and all these people could come up. But in the end, Bev Shea was gonna come up and sing before Billy Graham preached. And in the end, there was gonna be the choir with Just As I Am. So there's a sameness, there's a signature sound that doesn't exclude what's new, variety, um, kind of what's springing up from the grassroots and yet is faithful to itself. The kind of uh, global interconnectivity we see today, the eager reporting of church news from around the world in Christian magazines and media in the United States, um, the uh, ready exchange back and forth of Christian leaders and workers between the U.S. and uh, other parts of the world. And more and more people coming our way now too. Mr. Graham and the, and the Evangelistic Association were some of the first Americans to start to build those networks, make those ties of fellowship and partnership. So I think uh, they deserve some major credit as being pioneers in all of this. You can really see on a very virtual, on a very global level, that people who went to the Crusades define themselves as members of a global evangelical community, something you could call the Billy Graham global Christian family. And I think that is also a realm where, he, where I would say he had an impact. I think if Billy Graham had not had the ministry he had, the evangelical church would have never been as united as it has been since at least the 1960s, 70s, 80s, and even to today. It was splintering. I was young in those days and I could see it. It was going in this direction and that and the other, let alone a uh, relationship with, the, you know, what you would call liberal theologians or something. Uh, in the body of Christ, there wouldn't have been the unity that we've experienced. Billy, you could always count on him. Even if it was a three-minute prayer, the prayer <laughs> contained the cross and the blood and the resurrection and, and belief. So it's a great example, you know, and uh, I hope we can do that in the next generation because proclamation evangelism is being not insulted but downgraded and ignored and looked at as a, yeah, it's a thing of the past, you know. We probably will not see another Billy Graham uh, within certainly the Protestant community or religious community. The gaps now are wider than ever, in part because of media. There is uh, a proliferation of popular forms of media, especially the internet, the blogosphere, all of which I think accentuates the divisions in society, be they cultural, political, or economic, uh, making it all the more difficult, I think, to bridge those gaps. We miss Mr. Graham. But I hope we of the next bunch, someone, uh, we can get together again, you know, and say, how can we work together as a body? How can we keep proclaiming the good news? One of the main lessons from the Crusades is that the gospel is big, bigger than any one of us for our particular ministries. Now, Mr. Graham, for all his, all his fame, his notoriety, he had that sense too. I think that's one of the reasons he was so eager to make friends and to make referrals and to connect Christian people together for the gospel's sake, was because he had this sense that God's plan and uh, God's timing 
And God's moving in the world is more than any one of us can uh, presume to comprehend, much less own. Even though he's at the center of things, he fundamentally is not the point. It's Jesus Christ. The way I see it and the way Graham himself saw it is that if only one person found Christ, if only one person was found by Christ, if only one person's life was transformed, it was worth it.